Fifty years ago, a western Colorado community looked up at 1,600 acres of gladed aspens and pines clinging along the northern edge of the world's largest flat-top mountain. These pioneers took note of the 250 inches of light, dry Grand Mesa powder which falls annually and saw opportunity. They marshaled family members and close friends, took exploratory turns on early ski gear, and began the audacious founding of Powderhorn Mountain Resort. There's a wealth of history of skiing on this mesa. Mesa Lakes Ski Run was one of four areas in Colorado at the time. A Mesa Lake Ski Run across from Mesa Lakes Resort back in the 30s. Then they had Mesa Creek Ski Area, which is just up the road. And from the Mesa Creek Ski Area, the energy and the love of ski came to Powderhorn in 1966 and started this area. And it's just kind of evolved and continued on from that. Bob and I served on the first uh, board that organized Powderhorn. One day, Bill Foster and I, we were coming down off the hill and soaking wet from that rope hole, and he said, you know, we've got to do something about this area. Guys like Bob Seed around the country, they came in and said, you know, we ought to do this. As Mesa Creek continued to develop, uh, they essentially ran out of room up there. It was the U.S. Forest Service that went to the operators of Mesa Creek and said, hey, Beaver Creek Basin looks like a much better place to have a ski resort than the Mesa Creek drainage. The original trails were laid out by Gordy Wren, who came out of Steamboat. He's a former Olympian. They contracted him to come over here and start laying out some of the original trails. Originally, when Powderhorn opened, it was a lot of local stock was bought. We were talking in those days of $630,000 for the whole package. And they essentially sold $350,000 worth of shares, which were sold at a dollar a piece. And then they managed to back that up with an SBA loan, which was a, a deal that Bill Foster put together. But they literally put down Main Street, you know, and, and everybody, here's 100, here's 200, here's $500. And that's how they made the move and built that ski area. Well, I think it was a bunch of guys that wanted to ski, and we were selfish about it from the standpoint that we wanted it for ourselves. Everybody donating their time, and it was a lot of time. We just needed to get a belt. I guess we were taking such a beating on that old rope, though, that <laughs> we didn't dare not get it done. Ended up deciding we needed a home lift. We bought the lift for 30000 bucks, something like that, and then we built the damn thing. And it was so steep. Word around Aspen was, if you can ride the pulling lift at Powderhorn, you can ski anything on Ajax. <laughs> uh, Harold Harvey and I and Greg Schaefer, we happened to be the probably the first ones to ski off the new double chairlift when they opened up Powderhorn. We weren't supposed to, but nobody was paying attention and they were running the lift, so we bailed on. We got to the top, we found out they had no ramp. We had to throw our skis one way and jump off the other. And the last 50 yards down here was just mud. Governor Love came out and he cut the ribbon on the first opening of Powderhorn Ski Area. He'd come over and, and ski at Powderhorn. He just loved it. And at the time, they said, Camp, why don't you go ski with uh, John Love for a while? I always tell my buddies, I got to ski with the governor. First time we really had what we call a genuine ski area. They were quite exciting for the community, and we had tremendous local support. It's a brand new ski area. Everything was new. All the customers were new. It was just such an exciting time. Gordy Wren, who was from Steamboat, started the Buddy Warner League. I taught for Gordy at Loveland Basin. Only other Buddy Warner program was in Steamboat at that time. As far as I know, Powderhorn was the second ski area to have the Buddy Warner program. And that was probably one of the proudest moments that we started our program and it's just gone huge. Eventually Harold Harvey took over and Harold uh, was really the, one of the finest men I've ever met. And I can remember my dad, we had a small dozer on our ranch and we brought it up and when lift two was being built, my dad took it over there and flattened it all out for the bottom terminal of that chairlift. The lift line over in the west end had not yet been put in. We would hike up the lift line to the top of the mountain and start cutting trees just sawing trees. <laughs> there was no training. Uh, the, if, I, I had never used a chainsaw before. The lift poles were put in. We uh, 
held them steady as the helicopter lowered them. There's no such thing as hazard pay. And speaking of the pay, it was two bucks an hour. I, I couldn't even tell you how many ways they tried to make snow, and it was not good snow. You know. We didn't have any snowmaking equipment. He came in and he said, I figured our snowmaking was a problem. And I, and I said, no, wait a minute, where'd you get a leaf blower? And he said, the city. I said, do they know you got their leaf blower? He said, no, no, it's good. That guy shoveled snow, and it blew the snow out, and the guy said, hand pack it. Spent all day shoveling snow out on the ski run so the ski area could get opened up. Yeah, overall in the 70s, it was just growth years, and, and uh, I think we just enjoyed skiing so much that we just hit it, you know. It, the 70s was, was great. Beer and the skiing and dances in the old lodge, and the floor would just be shaking. I mean, to the point where you, you thought maybe that Hummer was coming down. There was no dress code. It was just a pair of jeans and a Levi jacket, a pair of work gloves, and you ski till, you know, the last lift go around and, and come down powder keg. There was a powder keg bunch called uh, Four O'Clock Club. Four o'clock, top of keg, and just hoot and holler all the way down that thing. Be fun time in the spring, and then the lifts shut down. That's when the, the big party started. Bob Sizek and my dad riding the motorcycles up uh, Lower Peacemaker. Bill Foster was probably the driving force of getting this started. The, the Foster family um, played a, a major role in this resort. Bill Foster, he was uh, a giant of a man in, in all ways. Sidewinder um, was eventually renamed and dedicated to Bill Foster, hence the name's Bill's Run. He had this whole theory that he would, you know, ski the whole mountain. He'd get so mad at us because we'd go flying down. Ski area changed to ownership after Bill Foster passed away and the oil shale boom and bust. Sometimes you didn't know, you know, being around the ski area, whether or not we had jobs after the ski area closed. It was a day-to-day -day type of thing. And then the ski area sold to uh, Jim Scott, Scott Cable. Really good change in a way. We got a new lift because the old lift was not working anymore. Uh, we got people up here. It was fun times. It was year-round resort back then. Scott was the high and the low. He came in with the bang, went out with the bang. Toward the end there, when they were bankrupt, I know employees weren't getting paid. Gentlemen showed up with a suitcase full of money and was paying people cash out of it. Scott's hadn't been here. Powderhorn could have gone under back then. At the time that I was here, there were six different ownerships in that time. And you had people come in, they brought the area to a certain level, and then like a stepping stone, then somebody else came in, somebody else came in until the present owners. Our focus is really on enhancing the overall experience on mountain. You know, they really focus on skiing. That's a great thing. Now working for the current owners, you know, they've embraced the locals it, and Powderhorn is a strong name again and it's such a good vibe again. We finally have an owner of the ski area that we're, we did not have to teach how to ski after they bought a ski area. Right. I'm looking forward to realizing the potential and all the opportunities that this mountain has and uh, look forward to the next 50 years. The past five decades have been marked with many highs and many lows, but Powderhorn thrives today. A new ownership team has invested in chairlift upgrades, snowmaking expansions, and a growing network of downhill mountain bike trails. While the infrastructure has improved, the experience remains the same. Gather the family, gather friends, and set out exploring. In this spirit, Powderhorn celebrates a milestone and looks towards the many opportunities ahead. I think we're the luckiest people on the planet to live this close to that good of snow and that good of ski resort is powerful.